I will introduce Dr. Metzner now. Um, he had an ordinary enough start to a brilliant career, degrees from Oxford in psychology and philosophy, and then a PhD in clinical psych from Harvard. He is a lifelong student of transformation of consciousness. In 71, way back then, he wrote The Maps of Consciousness, one of the earliest attempts at comparative cartology of consciousness. And he had the very good fortune as a grad student to work with Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, also known as Ram Das, at the Harvard Psilocybin Projects. He co-wrote the, the Psychedelic Experience and was editor of the Psychedelic Review. He was academic dean for 10 years at the California Institute of Integral Studies, where he's now Professor Emeritus. He taught classes in altered states of consciousness, the unfolding self, and developing ecological consciousness. He has many publications. Some he's brought with him today. Let's not let him take any home. They're available for sale, and he's offered to sign them, if you would like, after the lecture tonight. Um, he maintains a website and a blog at Green Earth Foundation. And then there's a mailing list on the table. If you didn't sign it on the way in, catch it on the way out, and then you'll receive communications from Dr. Metzner. And also, there's a very sweet video out on YouTube of Dr. Metzner leading what looks like a line dance singing the Bardo Blues. <laughs> it's delightful. Why don't you give a warm welcome to Dr. Ralph Metzner. Thank you, Kathy, for that generous uh, introduction. Can you hear me okay like this? This works? Yes, the, the video of the line dance, um, well, that was kind of an accident. Not an accident, but unexpected. Uh, it was at the conference honoring Albert Hoffman's 100th birthday, which was a conference in Basel, Switzerland, in 2004, uh, attended by about 3,000 people. Uh, and um, anyway, um, uh, so the, the organizers asked me. They had they had all the speakers, including Albert Hoffman, up on the stage, and and uh, he he was like a hundred years old. But but um, you know he's a very upright and very strong voice, not at all frail. He he did have a, a cane to to walk to help him walk. Uh, and uh, but he did it too. He did the. You know, it's, some of you may be familiar with this South American ayahuasca church called the Santo Daime. They take ayahuasca and they dance. Um, and uh, it's a church. You know, it's like gospel, like singing. It's very rhythmic, kind of celebrating, honoring the divine. It's not like a journey where they go inside. They sing and dance songs and uh, like hymns, but like gospel. And they do two steps to the left and two steps to the right. It's very simple, kind of back and forth like that. So um, I have a recording um, uh, of songs. And anyway, they, they used a, a record, one of my recordings uh, and uh, translated it spontaneously into uh, Santo Daimi dance and then got 2,000 people to get up and do it. Uh, <laughs> It was great. It worked out well. See, because they had movable, movable chairs. You couldn't do it in an auditorium where the seats are fixed. But I've since started to doing that, uh, sometimes in lectures. And, and people usually appreciate it, you know, because you're sitting in a lecture, especially at a conference, you're sitting for hour after hour after hour, and then you have a coffee break and talk with other people. Uh, but people really appreciated that they could kind of de uh, okay, engage with some of the ideas and images and symbols while moving in a very simple way. So that was the, the story behind that little story. So, um, um, so my title, I want to talk to you because you're, you're the Jung Institute and connected to, to Carl Jung. And it's an interesting thing. Um, I was very influenced by Jung. I wouldn't describe myself as a Jungian, per se, in a strict sense. Jung himself actually once said, I am not a Jungian, and I don't want to be one. 
because he, he was uncomfortable about having followers, you know, who described themselves as a younger. Unlike Freud, he was the opposite. He liked to have, and he, he was, had very strict rules about who could call himself a Freudian, and it was constantly throwing people out who, you know, distancing himself from people that didn't agree with his theories, like Wilhelm Reich and Carl Jung. Jung was not a Freudian. That was the big story between them. And so was Wilhelm Reich. Um, but um, nevertheless, I have a very, very high regard for Carl Jung uh, uh, as a psychologist and psychotherapist, and my work is very influenced by him, and my practice is very, very influenced by him, as well as by other people, as well as by Freud. And in that sense, I follow, as a therapist, the lead of my very close friend, Stanislav Graf, who's a Czech psychiatrist, who was also familiar with psychedelic drugs, as I was and am. And, um, felt that he also integrated, took the best of Freud's idea and Jung's idea. Uh, because Jung broadened the Freudian insights uh, of mechanism defense and the unconscious and all of those kind of things, prim prim primitive impulses and defenses against them, and broadened them, Jung broadened them out into the collective. That was one of his big expansions. Into the collective so that there could be these um, archetypal ideas that underlie whole groups of people or even all of humanity. Um, so, um, uh, so the idea that they share, and Graf shares, and I share, is that the, the, the so-called unconscious, um, which I actually, they don't use the term the unconscious anymore because uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's what linguists would call a reification. It makes it sound as if there is such a thing as an unconscious something or a place. The unconscious doesn't actually exist. <laughs> you know, we have certain thoughts and some of the thoughts are sometimes unconscious. And certain feelings and impulses and so forth are unconscious. And some of them are sort of semi-conscious and some of them are more conscious and intentional. And we can talk about that. So as an adjective, that's one thing. To talk about the unconscious makes it sound like it's a place, and it's not a place. It's usually in books that they read about it, it's set up in layers. You know, well, you've got the unconscious here, and, and then you know, you've got the, uh, the conscious, and then the unconscious, and in between you have the pre-conscious, and then you have other layers, other writers will write, well, you have the unconscious, the, the, the conscious, the pre-conscious, the personal unconscious, and then the collective unconscious. And then some of the neo-Jungians, you probably know this, actually made a distinction in the collective unconscious and said, well, there's the, the collective unconscious, the archetypes that's shared by all humanity, all human beings. Uh, but between the personal unconscious and the collective unconscious, there's a cultural unconscious that's shared by some human beings, the ones belonging to a certain group of people, for example, Jewish people, or Christian people, or Buddhist people. <laughs> Uh, or Asian people. So it's kind of collective more than the individual, sort of primordial images. And some of the later Jungians acknowledge that. And I actually think, and I've written in some of my books, that even the idea of the collective unconscious needs to be ex uh, expanded. And because that's, that's because of my studies in ecology and uh, you know, the wider planetary world in which we live. Because the collective, the, the collective unconscious is the level of human beings all human beings. So beyond that or below that, if you like, it's not really actually below anywhere, <laughs> but beyond that is the consciousness layer sh that is shared among all animals. And human beings are animal species, so all species of animals have a kind of consciousness. We know that now. Animals are not unconscious. And they're not dealing with archetypes the way we understand archetypes. So what is it? It's some other kind of layer, some other kind of consciousness. You could go all animals, and then you could have another layer that could be all life, all organic life. You know, that would include plants and mushrooms and fungi and plants. You know. And then you could have another layer, and ecologists, in fact, do talk about that. We call it the entire planet. It's called Gaia consciousness. You know, and people like James Lovelock and well, of course, it makes sense that animals and plants are sentient beings. Why wouldn't the planet itself be a sentient being? What kind of a sense would that be? Of course the planet is a sentient being. It's not like human consciousness. 
but it includes, you know, human consciousness, just like our body consciousness includes cells, cellular consciousness. And so you could talk about uh, Earth, planet, planetary consciousness, and include all Earth. But why stop there? What's the next system? See, this is systems thinking. The next, and systems are inclusive, systems within systems. And then each system at each level is itself part of a larger system that function together interdependently. So the whole Earth, planet, Gaia consciousness is part of the solar system. So solar system consciousness, that plays a big role in, in traditional uh, societies. The idea of a solar deity, somehow, and all the planets in the solar system have the names of deities. <laughs> so the Greeks obviously thought, and the Romans, the ancient people obviously thought, planets were alive and they gave them the names of gods and goddesses. Well, somebody gave them those names, or human beings did, of course. Human beings uh, go around naming things. Other species don't do naming things. Have you ever had that experience? You, you go out for a walk and I used to have that, I go out for a walk in the woods and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to test myself, do I know the name of that plant and do I need to know the name of the plant? And, no, I don't know that one, I wish I would know that one, but I wish I knew more. And then I suddenly realized, it was kind of like a message or something, a realization. The plants and the trees don't care whether I know their names or not, or whether anybody gives them their names or not. Not at all. It has nothing to do with their essence. They're not aware of it. It doesn't matter to them. They lead their life just fine, whether or not we name them. That was really interesting. It was a big relief. I didn't have to go around worrying about it. I don't know the name of this plant, nor do I know how it does all the things that it does, you see. I don't have any idea of how the plant how the tree manages to draw the sap up and how the cells do all their biochemistry. How much of us do we know? And yet, of course, we know, the scientists know, and they have their language to describing it. So consciousness exists at many levels. So I was saying this solar system, but then, of course, if you go that, expand that system, the solar system is part of the galaxy. 200 other million solar systems. 200 other million solar systems which are themselves rotating in a gigantic disk over hundreds of millions of years, which are themselves, and there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in a galactic cluster, and there's hundreds of millions of uncounted clusters of galaxies in the universe. It doesn't stop, you see. When people talk about cosmic consciousness, universal consciousness. And then we are back to human being. You could always contract, expand, 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 expand through the different levels of the system. You could also go down the other direction. You could talk about the individual human being. You could talk about the organs in the body. So there's a heart consciousness, a liver consciousness, a muscle consciousness, a bone consciousness. Of course there is. And we become aware of it mostly when there's a pain or a disease. <laughs> Or if we're practicing yoga, then they focus, tell you to pro focus on your breath and become aware of your breath, and then maybe you become aware of your digestive system, you become conscious of these normally ongoing con unconscious processes. And then you can go on down, and this is true in psychedelic experiences happens, where you can get down to the level of cellular consciousness. And people take ayahuasca and you know, they tune into cellular processes. There's a Swiss scientist who's gone to, uh, taken biochemists and uh, neurophysiologists to the, to, the, uh, 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 to the Amazon and given them ayahuasca and tried, tried to get them to describe their experiences in terms of the language of biochemistry that they know. So they were able to describe their experiences and have the vision uh, that was relevant to their work. And they didn't, you know, use like the native people use images of serpents and you know, that kind of thing, uh, they use their languages. They can say, oh yeah, I can tune out. Jeremy Narby is a Swiss scientist who's, whose argument is that uh, his name, the name of his book is, I forget at the moment, uh, any of you know it? He's, uh, anyway, his thesis is that he, he's taken the descriptions of the ayahuasca visions of the shamans in the Amazon and compared that to the statements of the biochemists and neurophysiologists that, and geneticists, geneticists that are describing the processes at the cellular and molecular level and saying, 
They're the same thing. They're describing the same thing and the language of their tradition, of course. So the idea of the expansion of consciousness. I like that concept. No, that was actually a term that Leary came up with, my old colleague at Harvard, uh, to describe the effects of the drugs that later on were described as psychedelic. And uh, I actually, uh, and, and it was interesting, I recently, only recently came across some correspondence between Leary and Hoff, Albert Hoffman. You know, I was very close to Hoffman in his later years, but at the time, at the Harvard Project, we also corresponded with him. And he really liked the, this was before the term psychedelic was, discovered, was kind of agreed upon for these substances like psilocybin and LSD that we were exploring. And uh, then uh, uh, Hoffman liked, said he liked the idea of consciousness expanding. Uh, and then, but, but ultimately people came to use psychedelic, which is a kind of a made up term suggested by Aldous Huxley, uh, which means kind of something like mind manifesting. And uh, the reason I now um, have started to, in the last, last few years, started to go back to using consciousness expanding is because psychedelic has in the meantime, and this is interesting from the point of view of cultural history. See, psychedelics um, now have accrued a whole cultural history. In fact, a really terrible cultural reputation, actually. First of all, they're illegal, and there's all kinds of imagery about danger and madness and crazy and people doing wild, crazy things, going crazy, being crazy, being illegal, being in jail, going to jail because they should, all of that. That was all nothing, nothing, that was nothing. You could have had LSD, XYZ, IBM, just three neutral letters, meant nothing. It's impossible to think back to that era, see? You could never do that now. <laughs> so, and um, psychedelic has accrued other meanings. It's got accrued sort of meanings of paisley patterns. In fact, my daughter, when she was like nine years old, came back one day from school and said, hey, look at those colors, psychedelic, woo, woo. <laughs> she had no idea what the origin of that term was. It's paisley patterns. Well, I don't know if you've ever experienced LSD or psilocybin, but Paisley patterns is not the essential feature of an LSD experience. <laughs> Please, if it was, why would there be this whole this here about it? It's one way of representing some of the visuals. You see, it has nothing, nothing of the core. So anyway, in order to get back to, and I like the consciousness expanding because consciousness is itself a very mysterious kind of concept or term. It has so many different meanings, at least three different essential meanings, which I'm not going to go into now, but maybe, maybe we'll have time. But, but um, for one thing, so people, it's kind, of, it's kind of an abstraction. So when you say consciousness expanding, people, many people think, maybe you thought this yourself, consciousness can expand. Well, who knew? Is it, who knew that it's the kind of thing that can expand? What does that mean? See, it's two ordinary words. So, uh, actually, consciousness can expand uh, and it can also contract. And uh, it expands every morning when you wake up. And it contracts every evening when you fall asleep. When you wake up, you know, you, you, may, uh, you're, you may be having a dream or you may be sort of unconscious in a sleep state and then you start to open your eyes, you become aware of your body. You're in this body, you're in this bed, you're next to your partner, and then you're, and oh, this, this is my room, here's my dog, my cat, <laughs> my garden, my house, my job, my family, my society. A series of consciousness expandings happens every morning when you wake up. It's like taking off the blinders of sleep. In the sleep, you might have been living another life, another whole scene. And when you go to sleep at night, you contract, you, know, you withdraw. But now consciousness, uh, uh, con consciousness contraction, uh, so consciousness expanding means you become aware of more. So, for example, you can intentionally, um, your consciousness 
when you, um, when you go for a walk in the woods, whether alone or with somebody else, you're taking a walk, you're, you're not focusing on anything. You're just walking around. And you're hearing the birds and the bees and watching the tre seeing the trees and the clouds and the sky. It's a kind of a romantic, uh, no particular purpose, just to enjoy the scenery like that. Now, on the other hand, um, let's say you, um, you have to perform a piano concerto, or you have to go for a job interview, or you have to operate a heavy piece of machinery like a car. You don't want to be expanding your consciousness. <laughs> Um, you want to be concentrating, which is a narrowing of consciousness. I mean, each one of you, and I'm concentrating actually right now on all of you, and I'm concentrating on the thoughts that I'm, you know, verbalizing, and I'm concentrating on each one of you, and you're giving me the gift of your attention. In German, you say schenk die Aufmerksamkeit, which means the gift of attention. In English, you say pay attention. <laughs> Kind of interesting cultural difference between the German and the English, I don't know. <laughs> but in both cases, it means it's something that you give, that you do. It's not just passively taking in, you see. If you were just passively taking in, it's like being at the movies or something. It's not like that. And we got together because, uh, for which I thank you, for this purpose. Now, but our consciousness could expand. For example, if there was a loud sound, an explosion, then we would like all go, <clears throat> what was that outside? Or if a naked man or a naked woman walked in the door, we would like lose the focus on my, my talk, and you would think, what, what, is, ha what is happening here? There's some other story happening, you see. So consciousness can expand and contract all the time. Uh, if it contracts uh, intentionally, or uh, it contracts or expands intentionally with our, according to our intentions, or it can also contract and expand accidentally um, when our uh, attention is fixated. And when attention and consciousness is repetitively fixated, we call that compulsion and addiction. It's the difference between you know, an alcoholic drinking beer after beer after beer versus you know, normally you or I just drinking a beer occasionally, or wine, or whatever like that. The difference is not in the, f in the drug, <laughs> it's in the way that our consciousness, we let our self consciousness be altered by the drug, according to our intention, whether we're thinking, doing it with intention and awareness, and under our control, under our intention, or whether we're being pulled into an addictive, repetitive, compulsive pattern. Compulsions, addictions, obsessions are all in that fixated contractions of consciousness. If you've ever seen the film by, that was made by Richard Pryor, the comedian, where he described his, uh, the progression of his addiction to cocaine, it's, it's an awesome performance. I recommend that you, you get a copy of it because he describes how he you know, increasingly got rid of his friends, told his friends to go away, his friends kept saying, didn't want to do anything, just the pipe, crack cocaine, you know, just uh, several times a day, just go away, nothing matters, friends come, no, nothing matters, increasingly just go away, just leave me, you know, just like his world, his whole world shrank more and more. I think we can all see in ourselves or perhaps in people that you know, uh, similar kinds of pattern with addictive drugs or compulsive behaviors. It doesn't necessarily have to be a drug, it can be a compulsive behavior. So the general idea of expansions and contractions. And of course, from the point of view of psychological self-understanding and growth, you want to have the expansions and the contractions of consciousness under your own intention. And you want to, and those of you that are therapists or work in therapy, you know that a lot of work in therapy is you know, freeing yourself from uh, involuntary compulsions, addictions, like that. Okay. So if I press this. Okay, so these are two of my heroes, Albert Hoffman and Carl Jung. Um, Jung was older, of course. He died in 19... Uh, when did he die? 55, I think? 61. 61. Albert Hoffman died in 
2004 or three. So, uh, but they were both from Switzerland, one from Basel and one from Zurich. They didn't know each other. And I think they're two, they're two alchemists. And Switzerland is the home of the co largest concentration of alchemy. Basel is the you know, alchemical museum and long tradition, centuries old tradition of alchemical experimentation. It's really interesting that their work um, was so interesting. But see, Jung ex did all these fantastic explorations of the unconscious layers of the psyche and using, he wrote four of Jung's 20 volumes of collected works are about alchem alchemy, they are alchemical texts. Where, but he was not a chemist. It was Jung was a, Hoffman was a chemist who knew nothing about Jungian psychology. Nothing whatsoever. But he, um, and uh, in fact, he was not aware of this connection of his connection to the alchemical tradition until I talked with him about it. But he had a mystical vision when he was a child, when he was walk, walking in the woods and uh, as a nine-year-old boy, and he had this, uh, he had several mystical visions, but he had this vision of uh, all of nature and himself included was one vibrant whole where he felt completely encompassed, safe, protected, um, in his core and in everything. And um, uh, he had no language to describe this. He said, he said to himself, he had this thought, and he only told this story much, much later, 50 years later, <laughs> um, that, uh, oh, I'll never be able to describe this or paint it. I think I'll become a chemist. Because in the vision, it was nature. And chemistry, matter, it was matter, nature, nature, matter. And chemistry was the science of matter. And it was when he accidentally absorbed through his fingernips, through supposedly some sloppy lab technique, which in itself is a kind of an impossible story, Swiss chemists are probably the most obsessive compulsive people on the planet. I mean, they have to be. Think about it. A pharmaceutical chemist does not have sloppy lab techniques. It's just unheard of. But he apparently, because LSD is so fantastically potent, the amounts that can change your consciousness dramatically is invisible, basically. You can't see it. It's so minute. A hundred micrograms. A hundred micrograms is a hundred millionths of a gram. It's a tiny invisible speck. The only way you could see it is by putting it in something else. And, uh, but so he absorbed some. I don't know how, he said. And then he started having these in, uh, incredible visions. And uh, um, he, uh, uh, at first, kind of scary because he didn't know what was happening. And then when he went home, and then he realized what was happening, then he realized what, he said, he realized, oh, uh, this must have something uh, he didn't really know what was happening in his mind, you see, because he, he didn't realize that it was connected to a material substance until he remembered his childhood experience. Oh, it has to do with matter. The matter I was working with, which is, was in fact ergot, an ergot derivative, which is in fact where LST comes from. So, um, now, uh, so I'm going to say a little bit more about uh, LSD, but now Jung, uh, uh, Jung you see, they, li they lived, they were Swiss, they undoubtedly, I mean, Jung had heard of psychedelic drugs, and he himself said, no, um, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to take them. I mean, yeah, he said something like, yes, because some of his followers had said, well, maybe this can give you access to the unconscious. And he said, well, I don't need to, want to take it or need to take it. I have enough access to my unconscious. In fact, I have just, I can just, just as much as I can handle, basically. <laughs> well, as you well know, you know, and some of you are maybe reading the Red Book and where he described his many years long experimentation where he went into the unconscious himself and, and find a way to bridge from the unconscious back to his ordinary conscious life. Because that's the thing about psychedelic drugs. It's not just a matter of having an experience. Unless you can bridge the experience back into your ordinary life, then it's a waste and it could in fact be dangerous. Uh, and uh, at worst, it's a kind of, at, at the least, it's a kind of a distraction. Um, and uh, 
for example, the, Charles Todd is a psychologist, and he, he interviewed a number of Buddhist meditation teachers in California. And, uh, uh, and uh, who you know, started teaching, studying and teaching Buddhism in the 60s, and he asked them what role psychedelics played in their practice originally and now. This is a Buddhist long-term, 20-year-long meditation, Buddhist meditation practice, practitioners and teachers. He said, well, it, psychedelic experiences, one or two I had, played a very significant role initially when I was first starting off, because they gave me an experience of what was what possible for consciousness to experience. And, uh, but none now, because then I realized, well, okay, but I'm not gonna be taking this drug all the time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, then start doing the meditation, which otherwise, is, the meditation is notorious for that, because you can, you know, meditate for decades and never have any experience. In fact, that was one of Houston Smith, you know, the scholar who wrote The Religions of Man. He wrote a book about, in which he discussed Christianity and Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism. And the first time he took a psychedelic psilocybin or LSD, he said, oh, now I really understand the essence of the religions that I've been writing about as a scholar from the outside. Um, so it's a mysterious thing, and that's that kind of experience, that kind of inability to communicate something that seems very important to try to communicate is uh, really at the core of the alchemical tradition. Because the alchemists are always saying exactly that. So, um, um, oh, and so when you compare, you, so you, uh, 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 Hoffman was an alchemist who focused on the material aspect. So matter and psyche and spirit, they're all on a continuum. Uh, they're not radically different, they're on a continuum and uh, they can be explored and are explored and then the continuum of human beings is not like, and it's not abnormal. <laughs> um, and uh, Jung, of course, had the, had the genius to expand the, con the conceptions, uh, the regular psychological theories of the unconscious, like Freud and others, and uh, into these spiritual realms. But he didn't have any um, direct experience of a, uh, um, except through his dreams, of the possibility of a substance inducing a mystical experience. His method was dreams. He didn't do alchemical experiments. In other words, he read books. All his alchemical writings are about, are, are about interpretations of old alchemical books written in Latin and Greek, which he was a scholar of. And, with, you know, and he wrote these books with enormous footnotes and uh, absorbing it, talking about the, the actual um, imagery, the imagery and thought forms and uh, ideas triggered um, by the associations in that tradition and how that could relate to the personal psychological processes of a person. Like somebody would come in and say, well, I had this weird dream where, you know, I saw this man, he had the head of a dragon and the body of a lion and, and Jung would say, hmm, let me think. And you go to the bookcase and get out a book and there was a, would be a picture from a 17th century text of exactly that image. And that was very significant to the person. And he said, oh, okay, I'm not crazy. Somebody else had the same image, you see. That's the thing. If you have a weird, really weird image, you might wonder, am I crazy? Am I going nuts? But if you have one other person who can say, no, I had the same image. I saw the same thing. Then that... Uh, um, means it gives it a little bit more reality. Do you see that? That's why I have a formula in one of my book that says the subjective experience plus one equals objective. <laughs> subjective plus one equals objective. Then if you add plus two, three, four, then it becomes more objective. <laughs> objective is basically shared subjective experiences. You can be objective about your subjective experience. You can be objective about su subjective experience, and that is, in fact, what I think the science of consciousness needs to be, and which is it's not at the moment, because at the moment, the science, so-called science of consciousness limits itself to uh, the material, trying to explain consciousness away in terms of brain waves and molecular patterns, 
which is one level, yes. Doesn't explain consciousness, however. That's why they'll never explain consciousness that way, because consciousness is not something that you need to explain. So let me go on. So this is, uh, uh, and I'm going to come back to the book, The Expansion of Consciousness, in which I talk some more about the, the alchemical tradition and Jung, but let me just also go on and talk about alchemy a little bit. And in this book, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the, uh, the book in which I explain the, the, the process that I that I call psych, uh, uh, divination, which is a kind of a fusion of psychotherapy. I'm a trained psychotherapist, but I also, but psychotherapists, uh, as you know, they primarily focus their attention on the past. And in recent years, you know, a new profession has arisen called coaching, where that helps people not so much to deal, with, come to terms with their past, but to help to formulate and attain their, uh, their goals and their aspirations in work, in family, in, uh, you know, at every level, whatever, including spiritual. <laughs> um, so uh, divination to the past is essential to, to uh, healing and therapy. For example, past divination uh, in medicine is known as diagnosis. You diagnose an illness, you want to go, whether it's physical or psychological, when did I get that infection, when did I get that poison, that injury, that wound, that trauma, blah, blah, whatever it was, Oedipus complex, whatever it was, in your past. That's for the diagnostic part, but then you want the prognosis, in other words, how to heal it in the future. Now, if you're doing visioning, visioning is sort of the opposite of psychotherapy. You're, it doesn't matter what the, you know, it's like, where am I going? Where am I going with my life? What am I going to do after I grow up? That's the child wants to know. The five-year-old says, I want to be a pilot. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, so he's got a vision. Well, people go on a vision quest. Go to the wilderness and fast. Vision quest. What's my vision for my life? Oh, great spirit, the Indians pray, sing songs. What's my vision? For? That's not so much a job. I mean, you might have a vision for your job as well. I'm going to be a stockbroker. My vision is to make a million dollars. <laughs> That's a kind of a vision. Uh, we might not think it's very spiritual, and maybe it isn't, but still, it is a kind of a vision. It's a goal. It informs the goal. It informs your actions. It's future-oriented, and it's open-ended. Because you don't know whether you're going to get, that's the one difference. You can access the past through memory, you can access the future through vision. The only difference is that the future is, visioning is probabilistic, uh, not the past actually happened the way it happened. Although you may have different interpretations of it, the future is probabilistic. So we all do that visioning, visioning the future all the time. You, you, you have a vision, you're following a vision of your life, you know pretty well, you know, almost 100% certain, but not, not 100%, but 98, 98%. You, you're still going to be, you know, in the, in the near future, going to be living in the same house, married to the same person with the same children and the same job and doing the sim similar kinds of things, pretty much, you know. Now, you may start to go through periods when uh, things are going to, in upheaval and then you don't know. Where do I want to where where do I want to go? Why am I actually doing this? <laughs> For what purpose? So then you're asking yourself vision questions. And you may go and do have a vision quest, or may you have a vision. Like the Indians would go and pray for, pray for a vision. But we might go to a a, bit, a consultant or a family consultant and organizer and uh, um, and dreams, you see, this there was a big insight that occurred for me about 10, 15 years ago when um, I was teaching about this parallelism between vision and, and uh, vision and the future and memory and healing in the past that um, uh, it's like vision and memory are like two sides of the same uh, coin, so to speak. In fact, I use the image of the Roman deity Janus the two-headed deity as a symbol of that process. If you're going to be doing the workshop tomorrow, then we're going to be working with this Janus principle a lot. We're going to do some um, processes 
looking into the past to, uh, because it's a, it's a double, in both cases, it's a double process. You go into the past, but not just to relive the past, that wouldn't be therapeutic, would it? Just to relive the past, you could do that endlessly and it never really makes any change. You want to integrate the past into your, into your present life and what it means for you in your present life and your future. Because like in a traumatic memory, for example, is one that hasn't been integrated. So you go into it again in order to uh, be able to make it part of your own self-history, your own self-concept, in order then to be free to go on with your life and not be driving your car or fixated in the rearview mirror and see what's coming behind you, to overcome you. And the same with the future. If you have a future vision, well, it's not enough just to have it. You have to do something with it, because if you don't, then what, what is it? It's like a... A fantasy. A fantasy is not the same as actually doing something, you see. It's kind of a substitute. Uh, and uh, so you, you have a vision and then you integrate that vision into your life. Uh, the little boy who has a vision, he's going to be a doctor. Well, then he has to, when he grows up, he has to go to school and go to medical school and you know, start practicing. Realizing, that's called realizing the vision. And realizing is the, is the counterpart for the future to remembering. That's why remembering is one of my favorite words in the English language. Because in the past, remembering is reconnecting. It's the opposite of dismembering. So when you remember uh, a tra traumatic memory that's, or, that's been forgotten or split off, then you're reconnecting something from your past history that you've been disconnected from. So... In uh, the alchemical divination, accessing your spiritual intelligence, and you probably know, have heard the concept of the multiple intelligences. You know, people say mathematical, verbal, um, spatial, kinesthetic, uh, all the different intelligences. Uh, in the educators and others know in learning, I think there are about six or seven different musical is another one. Uh, uh, almost like specific modules in the brain for these different kinds of intelligence rather than just one IQ, you know, so. Uh, and I'm suggesting along with some other people that there's a kind of a spiritual intelligence is the intelligence that, uh, <coughs> that you develop to that includes the spiritual dimensions of life and not. See, our mainstream sciences, including our mainstream psychology and social science, do not include the spiritual dimensions. And they haven't since the 17th century. That's part of the whole deal in the history of science uh, that was made between the church and the scientists. Because the church said, you can't deal with spirit, that's our department. You can only deal with matter. And the scientists said, well, okay then. You know, because they wanted to keep their jobs and they wanted to keep their heads. Because if you didn't agree with them, like Giordano Bruno, you know, he went to the stake. And Galileo said, knuckled under and said, you know, because uh, he wanted to say, well, the planet's moving. I saw it through my telescope. He said, and the, pri the priest, the cardinal said, no, 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 they're not moving. Otherwise, you know, the uh, St. Augustine would have said so, whatever. And he said, well, then, okay, if you're going to be that way about it. But he muttered under his breath, they poor see more of her, but they move. But he didn't let them hear that, you see. But they put him in jail, house arrest. You can start, keep looking through your stupid telescope and just don't say the planets move. <laughs> Only 500 years later, later in this century, the church finally apologized to Galileo. It took him a long time to come around. It's kind of weird when you think about it, so that our whole scientific conception, see, has negated any mention. You can't write a scientific paper and get it published if you mention God or spirit or consciousness or psyche. What is that? What is that? Is that science? It's not science. <laughs> That's dogma. It's dogma. Of course, there have always been exceptions. The greatest scientists have always been completely different. Albert Hoffman was one. Einstein himself was one. Einstein himself said, to me, the most significant thing is the sense of awe that we felt at the mystery, the unknown, the unknown. 
not the known. The known is not so interesting. The unknown is interesting because the unknown is, attracts us because we want to know what we don't know. Isaac Newton, the same thing, often regarded as the most in, you know, intelligent scientist ever met. He said, you know, I may have discovered a few things, but you know, I feel like I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm a little, I was like a little schoolboy who uh, down by the ocean, you know, uh, found a few shiny pebbles that were kind of interesting, but beyond lay the vast boundlessness of the ocean, of which I knew nothing. That's the true humility of a true scientist, see. So, accessing your spiritual intelligence um, for healing and guidance. Healing always related to the past, guidance for the future. Okay. These are two alchemical mottos that are, I think, the key or a key to understanding um, the alchemical process. And uh, I think of alchemy as uh, there are three traditional systems of transformation. Shamanism, alchemy, and yoga. And they're systems of transformation at every level, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. Spiritual and physical, emotional, mental. And shamanism, of course, the oldest, going back to the old Stone Age, involving the shamanic journey for healing and power. The way like people like Michael Horner, who's a good friend of mine, an anthropologist, uh, have brought the ancient shamanic traditions uh, and, and condensing uh, and distilling them, the essence of them, what's the core process, uh, over and above the particular symbolic language used in this condition or that condition. It's a, it's a journey that you take to, to find knowledge and you may have an animal that you ride with or move with on this journey or some kind of vehicle, some kind of vehicle. You, you identify with an animal, you fly like a bird, or you know, ride like a horse, or like that. In, uh, in alchemy and, uh, alchemy and uh, yoga, I think of as the Eastern and Western kind of extensions of, of uh, uh, sham shamanic practices, because in shamanic, they're also multi-level, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. And, uh, you know, they're different, they know the different kinds of yoga, hatha yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, meditative, but it's always, always the spiritual dimension included. But in the West, you see, because of the peculiar religious history in the West, uh, India didn't have that history with yoga. The Indian scientists don't have any problems with acknowledging that spirit is fundamental. <laughs> in fact, that's what Indian science always say. But in the West, you couldn't say that because it's a cultural, but it's a cultural history. It's not true. It's not actually true. It's a self-imposed sort of um, lobotomy. <laughs> like you're not going to look at certain parts of reality. In fact, the core of reality, which is the spiritual essence. Because that was the department of the church, even although the people practicing science don't even believe in the church anymore anyway. They have long stopped following the church's commands. <laughs> Weird, isn't it? Uh, and um, so um, the alchemists then, you know, and alchemy, so in the 17th century, the alchemists had to stop doing, who wanted to continue practicing alchemy, had to stop doing so, uh, or else, you know, get burned at the stake. And, uh, and the same with the shamans. Um, and, and the shamans were the ones that were called as, as witches. You know, the witches rode on a broomstick or whatever to find healing. They were the healers. They were the healers. Not only women, but men too. And uh, the, um, the church said, no, you can't do that. That's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll burn you at the stake. You know, it's pretty serious. So that, the tradition of, so alchemy split from chemistry. And chemistry is alchemy except with all spirit and psyche out, just matter. In the same way that astrology, astronomy is the same as astrology, it was originally one science, but astronomy is astrology uh, with, uh, uh, with all the 
uh, relationship of how the planetary movement relate to human consciousness and life on Earth uh, exed out. Because the planets are just rocks out there zipping around and not anything to do with the psyche or the spirit. Even all the Greeks and all the others you know, had been saying so. And Isaac Newton, the great chemist, it was in fact an alchemist and did alchemical experiments for 30 years. But, you know, he, he had such a reputation and he wrote all his stuff in secrecy. That's where the alchemist wrote, wrote or dis, disguised everything. They wrote it in a secret language so that only they amongst themselves could read their stuff. And the people from the Inquisition couldn't read it, so it was just, just nonsense. I now, I now think that the so-called nonsense of the alchemical text was a deliberate disguise. It was a deliberate tactic so that, and, and including the reputation, oh, the, the, because the church authorities would say, oh, these guys, are the, they call them the huffers and the puffers. They're just trying to make lead, you know, gold out of lead. They're just after the money. And that obviously can't be done. It's obviously stupid. It's impossible. And therefore, they're just greedy, stupid people like that. And the alchemists sort of accepted that reputation because it meant that people left them alone, except for the people that actually knew and wanted to practice what they were practicing. And they didn't talk about it. They talked about it in a secret code. So they had to write these books. They couldn't publish in the scientific journals of the time. They had to write it in secret and pass it along in secret. And then, of course, in the course of time, many of them also would forget the language and. You know, so a lot of the language is kind of garbled, but also not, as I think I'll be able to show you. So these two co core alchemical mottos, one is um, natura naturans. It's nature doing, being natural. Nature doing its natural thing. Nature being natural. And that's, you know, the core of uh, a core healing tradition stream. It's going back to Hippocrates, going back to Indian, you, the healer doesn't do anything, he just strengthens the body's, encourages, strengthens the body's own natural healing capacity, regenerative capacity, that's what the body does, through so nutrition, breathing, exercise, plants, massage, whatever. This natural means strengthening the body has its own the human being has its own natural healing, regenerative capacities, just strengthen it, natural ways. That's a very honorable tradition that exists to this day. You know, various like herbal, herbal, herbal medicine, homeopathy, homeopathy is a classic example of Indian, Indian medicine, Chinese medicine, acupuncture is the same idea. You know, it's just stimulate the meridians, Stimulate the body's own natural healing energy. The body knows how to heal itself. Of course it does, otherwise it wouldn't be here. It wouldn't have evolved if it didn't know how to heal itself. It doesn't need interventions except in very few cases. If you have a broken bone, then you have to set the bone. And then the body heals itself. You put the bronze back together and they'll grow together. But the alchemists also had another saying, and that's opus contra natura. Opus is the work. So opus is like the chemical term that corresponds to, in shamanism, uh, the journey, the shamanic journey. The core process, the core method in alchemy is the opus, the work. So the work is consciously and intentionally working with the psychochemistry of your being, the multi-level chemistry of your being. And yes, the alchemists did take medicines, and they didn't make powders. But they also meditated, and they also uh, consulted the planets. <laughs> Paracelsus, you know, t did astrology. It, like Indian doctors to this day, they consult the horoscope of the patients. A lot of the shamans in Asia too also, they do combine shamanism with astrology, horoscopes. And uh, um, so, Opus contra naturam, seemingly the opposite of natura naturans, nature doing naturally. So why opus? How could the opus be against? The way I interpret that would be that nature also uh, is, uh, our nature becomes habitual. We have habits, habits of thought, habits of the body, um, and uh, that become unconscious, unconscious habits. Psychologists know this, <laughs> and to develop uh, the unconscious. See, in, in Eastern philosophy, now it's a, this is a big difference between Eastern and Western philosophies about consciousness. 
you know, we, we, in the West we all assume, well, consciousness is sort of the base state, you know, like we're all conscious, so we have consciousness, we say, except when we're unconscious. And uh, the Indian traditions, including Buddhism, Hinduism, all of them, say, no, the base, the, the, the default condition is unconsciousness. It's called avidya, not knowing, unconsciousness. And consciousness can only be developed through certain practices called yoga <laughs> and meditation. Mindfulness, that's why you sit in meditation, mindfully thinking, not just unconsciously thinking. And you practice mindfulness. At first you practice it not doing anything, just sitting. <laughs> just sitting and observing your breath, mindfully breathing. And then you extend that to mindfully eating. And then you move up to, as you get better at it, mindfully, consciously, Thinking about things, very difficult to do. So it's a very different way of thinking about it. So the opus, uh, the way that I think of the opus is like in inertia. The inertia principle in psychology in consciousness means there's always a tendency to run down and lose consciousness. Not, not being attentive, not, not attending. Else, how do things happen, right? How do, they, how do accidents happen? How do we spill wine on our clothes? How do we cr crash into another car? How do we lose our temper and start hitting somebody or yelling at somebody? Not conscious. We're slipping into unconscious. So opus contra naturum means, means like it's, the, it's like the Sufis and people like Gurdjieff. Like you, you, you challenge your own unconscious unten tendencies. And wake up, self-remember. Gurdjieff used to say, self-remember. Remembering who you are. Would you do the kind of, uh, would we do the things that we afterwards regret if we were conscious? No, obviously not. That's why we have to say, I regret. I'm sorry I did that. I wasn't thinking. I'm sorry I did that. I wasn't thinking. I forgot myself, we say. We forget ourselves all the time. So that's the idea of the opus contra naturum. So both are true. Both are mottos that are appropriate. Okay, so here's one of these mysterious images and the, the alchemist that appears in a, in a chemical book, I forget which one, 17th century probably, Body, Mind, and Spirit. But I think that's a, that's a cover, what I think, the way I interpret that image, I mean, Body, Mind, and Spirit, I think is a, it's like, it's a disguise. It's a, they put false labels on their images. This has to do with developmental psychology. This encourages you to look at the life cycle it's a young man, a middle-aged man, and an old man. And this is, this is a, a similar to the very frequent images of the triple goddess. The goddess as a, as a woman, as an old woman, uh, as a crone, and as a young maiden. Uh, the goddess imagery, the triple goddess is much more widespread somehow. The uh, triple god is much more rare. But it does, a, it does appear, and it, this is an example of it. Except they don't call it that, they call it. Uh, had something about body, mind, and soul. <laughs> so, um, um, but the alchemical images, the image itself speaks for itself, you see. And the people who knew, who had been trained and studying the tradition would know how to interpret it and s look at it as guidance for the thing. But it would be guidance. Look at the life cycle. And that's why um, in, um, in, in my book on alchemical divination, I have a whole chapter on looking at the life cycle. Uh, you know, the stage of life that you're in, the kind of work that you do. We have these three, you can think of these three main stages. The youth stage, which is up to the Saturn return. Childhood, adolescence, up to the Saturn return, which is the late 20s, 28, 29. The planet Saturn, which is time, comes back to its original position. And then you have, that's the period of growth and development in your life. You're learning and growing, expanding consciousness and developing your capabilities and skills and interests and uh, <clears throat> gradually becoming more independent, uh, you know, building new relationships like that. Then 30s, 40s, and 50s, roughly, and these, this is very rough, of course, it's not always like that. Uh, then you're like uh, the mature age, you're a functioning adult, you often, people get married, you know, have a family, start practice, you know, finish medical school, finish law school, you know, start practicing. Uh, very different, different change. The Saturn return, in my workshop, I often ask people, and maybe, maybe may do this tomorrow, to think about the Saturn return in their life, the period, 27, 28, 29, that's three or four or five year period. 
usually without exception, always without exception, I would say, the most fundamental turning point in everybody's life. In terms of uh, where they live, who they live with, um, what they do, what they, how they spend most of their time, like that. Um, so that's, um, uh, and then the elder phase starts at the late 50s. You see the second Saturn return, 58, 59. So then the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond the elder period. That's, again, different from the middle period. Then maybe by that time your children are grown up or almost grown up, and maybe, maybe you retire. Traditionally, you might retire and go, you know, become more spiritual, more interest, more maybe withdraw from some of the things. Of course, nowadays, people can start new jobs and... So, like, looking at the phase of life, that's, that's what this alchemical image points to, I think. So, now, now, now we'll get into some, some of these very strange sayings of the alchemists. And one of the key things, of course, this is what they call the stone, the lapis, the lapis philosophorum, the stone of the wise, the, the stone of the philosophers. And if you look through the alchemical text, as I did in, in, in my book there, the, the expansion of consciousness, the first one, uh, the first whole chapter is where I found a, you know, a number of these uh, definitions where they try to define what the stone is. And it gets very, very strange. Our stone is found in all mountains, all trees, all herbs and animals, and all human beings. So right away you know it's not like a stone, <laughs> like a rock in the usual way. But so what is it? It wears many different colors, contains the four elements, earth, water, fire, and air, which I relate to the material body substance of the human body, the water being the emotional, fire being the perceptual nervous, visionary, and uh, air being the mental. That's pretty universal kind of symbolic connection. And man and has been designated a microcosm. So that's the old uh, hermetic principle of the as above, so below. The human being is a microcosm of the greater universe, the universe within. Or this is from the 16th century, glo the glory of the world. They always give these alchemical texts these incredibly effusive names, you see. Something very precious. This stone is under you, near you, above you, and around you. So it's clearly not the case. You can't just say, well, it's a certain kind of stone or substance, or even as some of my friends and colleagues in, in the so-called psychedelic movement seem to think it's, well, it's LSD, obviously. The stone is LSD. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, it's not LSD. It's, it's a crystallized substance, <laughs> yes. It is a crystallized substance. But this stone can be under you, near you, above you, and around you. Found in all herbs and animals, and, and in human beings. So I'm just going to leave these there for you to think about. And uh, questions, uh, ask yourself, ask yourself what it means, what it might mean. Uh, I like the phrase, ask yourself, or ask myself. Because when you say, I ask myself, uh, you realize that um, you assume, you think, you believe, that there is a part of you that knows more than you do. Right? Otherwise, why would you be asking yourself? <laughs> You're asking somebody who knows more than you do. You're asking your higher self. As, you might, as we might say, it's like, or the ego is asking the self. And uh, when you ask, you make yourself receptive. That's why I think questions are more interesting than answers. Because the answer, when you have the answer, then it's like you close the book. You, know, you finish the research project, you close the book. Oh, okay, now I've got, I know that, now I'll put it in the shelf. If, uh, if you ask a question, then you are still searching. That's the whole thing about Zen, right? The Zen guy says, go, you know, meditate. What's, what's the sound of one hand clapping? The guy comes back and says, well, it's so and so. And he gives a, Zen master gives him a wax. Says, oh, that's not it. Go meditate some more. 
Every time, every answer he gives, that's not the answer, because there is no answer. The point is to ask the question. So questions open you up, keep you searching. Okay. Hermes Trismegistos, this Hermes, this Hermes the God, Hermes the Trismegistos is this kind of legendary, semi-legendary figure, a high-level initiate, he lived, who knows, mm. Egypt, nobody knows exactly when, maybe third, third, second, around the turn of the millennia, third, fourth century, before, after, nobody knows exactly. Uh, obviously a whole school, he initiated a school, it's a school of the hermetic tradition, which is also the alchemical, is the hermetic tradition. And it's a secret tradition, it's an underground tradition, you don't talk about it. The reason you don't talk about it is not because you want to, you know, uh, uh, you, you love secrets per se, or uh, is because it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be understood, which is in fact the case. <laughs> It wouldn't be understood unless you go through the processes that would help you to understand it, you see. Because it involves practices, like yogic practices, you don't really understand it. It's like, you know, chemists talking to one another, but it's hermetic, because if you're not a chemist, you don't understand it, the language, you don't know, you know what they're talking about, what the experiences are, what the observations are that they've made. Uh, so, so, um, but Hermes says, the sun is the father, the moon the mother, the wind bears it in its womb, and is nursed by the earth. So of the four elements, fire and air are male, masculine, by the alchemist, polarized, and water and earth, feminine, feminine, because fire and air rise up, water and earth sink down. Uh, so, um, in psychological, you say, in terms of the four functions, I would say air and fire are corresponds to thinking and intuition, and uh, water and earth to feeling and sensing. Uh, and uh, alchemical texts are filled with multiple illustrations of the four elements and, you know, and, and various combinations. Um, so the sun is the father, the moon the mother, uh, the basic polarity, which also is uh, right-left polarity. If you look at our chemical drawings, of which there'll be one next, uh, you'll see the male is always, uh, it's the right side of the body also. That's, that's the same as in yoga. I see Ida, Ida and Pingala. Yoga on the right side is Pingala. The sympathetic nerve system is the right, left side, the parasympathetic moon, feminine, Pingala uh, side. So, um, um, and then the conjunctio, see, is the integration of the fire and the sun, uh, fire, fire and water. The wind bears it in his womb. Why? That's a strange image. First of all, the wind is male. Wind has a womb. And uh, the way I interpret that, in fact, there's another image of it. But nursed by the earth, um, let me go on. Okay, so the next one is this one. This is an image of a from a series of images illustrating the conjunctio. The conjunctio is, uh, in a, you know, Jung wrote a 700-page book on the Mysterium Conjunctus. It's a kind of a core integrative alchemical process. It has many stages and many aspects. A series of images in <coughs> alchemical books showing different stages of the conjunctio. It's not just a one-shot deal. Integrating of the male, female, sun, moon, masculine, feminine, images, um, uh, solar, lunar, uh, in the body. So here you have uh, the male standing on the sun, uh, uh, on the right, you, you, and it looks, you're looking at it, it's on the left, but think of this as a picture of a human being. See, this is inside a person, this is not two people, this is one person. So on your right side, that's the solar side. Your left side is the lunar side. Um, and uh, each, uh, and, and she's standing on the moon, he's standing on the, on the sun, and uh, then they're giving each other their, uh, um, she's, they're giving each other their left hand. So they're making a first awkward gauche. You know the term gauche means left. <laughs> Contact. They're getting acquainted the male-female side of you. That's the first stage. And they're, 
they have these staff with flowers, and then there's a bird with a star coming from above, inspiring their getting together. Does that make sense to you? So, now, the wind has carried in his belly, see? He's got a fetus in his belly. Why? Because wind, air, is masculine, you know, but, uh, and uh, so it seems paradoxical. But uh, air is mind. The process of transformation, every process of transformation or healing has to start in the mind. You have to have the idea first. You have the idea. Otherwise, think about the, the, third, the word conception or concept means idea, and it also means conception. <laughs> Prior to birth, there has to be a conception. <laughs> Where the male seed and the female seed come together, called conception, and takes root. If you want to do anything, even self-transform yourself, become enlightened, you first have to have the idea that you want to be enlightened. <laughs> this is not going to happen accidentally or sort of by the way. <laughs> Obviously, it's like the intention in the mind. So that's how I would interpret that uh, image. Uh, the wind has carried it in its belly. And its nurse is the earth. You have the idea, but then you have to nourish the idea of transformation, in this case, the idea of transformation or enlightenment. You have to nourish it, feed it, protect it. It's not going to happen by itself. You can have the idea and never do it, then the idea just goes flying off like any, some other idea. And the, she's Mother Earth, you see. The, earth, the mother is always the Earth, and the Earth is always the mother. All life arises from the Earth. Okay, so our substance is openly displayed before the eyes of all, yet it is not known. So obviously, it's not a particular object. Two people could be looking at the same thing, and one is seeing it, the stone, and the other is not. It has to do something with your perception, with how you look at things. Learned doctors have it before their eyes every day. But they do not understand it because they never attend to it. I like the titles of the it's a 17th century text, The New Chemical Light. Right? This is when alchemy and chemistry were still one substance, looking at it from the point of view of chemistry. So of course, in every psychological process, the way we would say it nowadays, of course, every single psychological process, every thought, every feeling, every perception, there's chemistry going on, <laughs> of course. And there's whole sciences and neuropsychochemistry and you know, studying it in detail. But they don't they study it only with the external methods. They don't study it in themselves. And that's what the Hermeticists did. They studied it in themselves. And they regarded their own body, their own multiple multi-level psychocosmic organism as the laboratory in which you do the work that you're doing, that you're learning. And of course, you also do it out there, and you have potions that you take and drink and powders and da da da, and apply in your healing with animals and people and da da da. But the laboratory is, the opus is done inside. The healer, it's the same principle as the healer, heal thyself, right? Heal thyself. If you, you can't heal somebody else of a liver disease if you've got a liver disease yourself, <laughs> obviously. You first heal the liver yourself, you see. Then you'll be able to, then you, then you would go to the doctor that knows how to heal it. Obviously, he's known how to heal it. Um, okay, so have we done that one? Do the next one. Okay, so that's another stage of the conjunctio. So here they are already, the two sides of you, then they're sitting in the vessel. This is the vessel. It's like a hot tub. Except it's not a Mill Valley hot tub where you're sitting with your partner. It's the hot tub of your body. The vessel is the body. 
Actually, I would say the body and energy field. Because the, physical, the, the subtle energy body field, which extends 10, 15, 20, 50 feet out in every direction, is as much part of your vessel as the physical body. So um, they're sitting in uh, water, uh, and the water, the hot water, is melting the differences between them, is melting the separation between them. They've taken their clothes off, which means they're no longer covering. The cover, the, this is what, what uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, yogic traditions called coverings. Uh, I forget what the name they have is. Clashers, clashers, obstructions, blockages. Or Reichian body work, the muscle tensions, armoring, armoring that prevents different parts of your body from, you know, uh, because the muscles are tight from f the energy freely flowing between the two sides and be between all the different parts of the organ. So you're sitting in a hot tub using the warmth and the heat of the, the solutio, what the alchemists call this process, the solutio, which means dissolving, dissolving the tensions. In order to allow these two core energetic male, female, yin, yang, sun, moon, parts of your being come closer together. And notice here, it's the right, le right hand of one to the left hand of the other, left hand of one receiving the right hand from the other. See, this is a much more a closer conjuncture of the, t of the two. And now, this thing, this thing, the stone, is extracted from you. So that shows very clearly, it's something in you something physical, psychophysical, cellular, who knows. You are its ore, like a precious metal extracted. Has to be, like gold has to be extracted from the ore, not or, or, until it is. When you have experienced this, the love and desire for it will be increased in you. And I love this one too, 18th century, Gerard Dorn. We cannot be resolved of any doubt except by experiment. See, these people were real true scientists. <laughs> Don't take it for granted. It's not a matter of belief. Test it out yourself. See it for yourself. Practice it. The point of yoga is not to put forth some theory. <laughs> Same with shamanism. Test it. Apply it. Use it. And there's no better way to make it on ourselves. Heal or heal thyself. Okay. Then, so here's another stage of the conjunction. So here, the, the, tor the legs, the torso, the upper, lower torso, upper torso, are already conjoined into one. But the heads, the, two, the organism still has two heads. Because that's the hardest part. Because the brain is so complicated. That integrating the two brain hemispheres is very difficult. It takes a long time. Much easier to integrate the heart and the liver and the stomach and the different you know, other parts of the organism relatively can be harmonious. But harmonizing the two brain hemispheres is very difficult because it's so, so complex. It takes a long time. So there's an intermediate stage, the two-headed being. You could make some weird Hollywood movie about that. <laughs> they do make weird Hollywood movies about it all the time. <laughs> uh, so. Okay, it is called perfect. Perfect means complete. Perfected means complete. Because it has in itself the nature of mineral, vegetable, and animal. For the soul is triple and one, having four natures. So that shows right there, see? It's not just a human psychological process. <laughs> when the pure and essential elements are joined together in a loving equilibrium, as they are in our stone, they are inseparable and immortal, like the human body in paradise. See all kinds of, you can see all kinds of questions that arise. Oh, we have a human body in paradise? Obviously, it has to be like your human body in paradise, not somebody else's. <laughs> Okay, and this is another beautiful image of the conjunctio, uh, as, a, as the image of the marriage of fire and water. See, this makes it very clear you're not talking about anatomy. <laughs> you're talking about energies. 
So the, the fire on the, on the right, fire and water, and the water on the left, they're conjoining, the, the arms are conjoining, they're not really arms, they're not human arms, it's not a human form, just the face and head, enough indicated so that you can see, oh, this, this is in us. Maybe you could say this is an image of the, modern physiologists might say this is a sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. You know, we have these two parallel autonomic nervous system. One is more energetic, daytime sympathetic, doing and acting and fiery. The parasympathetic is more feminine, relaxing, re uh, nighttime, uh, that kind of thing. The most ancient secret, natural, incomprehensible, heavenly, blessed, beatified, and triune, universal, stage, stone of the sages. This is reminiscent, I don't know if you've ever read these Buddhist, some of these Buddhist texts and, or Hindu texts when they start talking about the different stages of enlightenment, where they just go on after on, phrase after phrase of, uh, in praise of these uh, realms of being and realms of consciousness that can be attained through these practices. And then I love this term, the Sophic Hydrolith. Hydrolith means water stone. Water like hydro and lith, stone. And Sophic again is wisdom, the water stone of wisdom. And that shows the stone, you know, so again, it's paradoxical, it's not just a rock. It's not just a rock. It's a, it's a water stone. So it, it's solid like stone, but flows like water. So what is like that? There is a consciousness like that. It's a state of consciousness. This is one of my teachers said, said I asked him, you know, what is it? He said, the philosopher's stone is not a magical object. It is the magnificent condition resulting from reaching objectivity. The, real, the ability to be objective about fact, to per know and perceive the hard fact stone like, of a given situation as it actually is, without illusion and distortion. Another analogy would be like in the Eastern Buddhist tradition, they talk about Vajra, Vajra consciousness. And Vajra uh, is both diamond and lightning. You know, va va diamond, the hardest substance known, stone and all that, the hardest substance known and lightning, the most brilliant bright light. Here's a modern painting by somebody showing the conjun conjunctio of uh, fire and water, but both female. See, the, the way different ways of doing the conjunctio is not always necessarily the same, because males and females can be fiery and watery, and so can males, and you know. This is a Janus, the Roman coin. The Roman used the imagery of Janus looking in the two directions as the imagery of, uh, of uh, I interpret that as being, uh, it was the coin of the realm. And Janus was the gatekeeper of the dog, of the gods, who uh, sat at heaven's gate and uh, paid attention to who was coming and going, the gods and goddesses in their various excursions. Janus always knew. And it's the, uh, the month of Janus, it's the root for January. You know, the month of January, the winter solstice, and uh, the turning point of the year is also the root for janitor, <laughs> uh, the gatekeeper, the doorkeeper. <laughs> he sees you where you're going. And it's a coin, coin of the realm. You pay to cross the border, pay the customs man, pay the customs man, pay the border crossing, pay admission, pay the price. This is just another chemical image showing the, the threefold division of, like uh, in this case, a threefold division of the body energy field. Usually having, like in Taoism, you have, you know, the, and, uh, the way I think of it, it's uh, the head, upper, upper throat head is one thing, more thinking awareness. The middle part is more like heart, abdomen, heart awareness, feeling awareness, lower part, abdomen, pelvic, more like sensory body kind of awareness. And the alchemists have those kind of, those kind of triple images, very, very widespread all over, including the, all the Buddhist stupors, you know, the, with the cube and then the sphere and then the triangle. All right, anyway. Uh, and this is from my book, The Alchemical Divination. So 
this is the way I work with the traditional chakras in the mi middle, but like the, da like the Taoists, I thought, talk about three chambers, upper chamber, middle chamber, cave of the heart, little cauldron, uh, pelvic abdominal area, and then there are centers in the legs. There's not just seven chakras, I mean, there's you know, 11 or 13 chakras depending. And there's chakras above the head and below the feet. Um, and, uh, but this is, this is the idea, and each, the energies in each of these main chambers is slightly different, and you work with them all, balancing them, refining them, like that. Um, and this is an, a chemical image. This is a, um, just a kind of mysterious image, just to give you an example of, uh, I forget actually which text is, it was some text from the 17th century. They talk about, they have these four balls of fire, Standing in a landscape, and it says, the text, the only text is, a fourfold fireball controls this work. Okay, here's how I interpret that. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, that's the text. Atalanta Fugians, 1618, 17th century, early 18th, 17th century. This four balls of fire is um, um, a yogic process working with fire in four main segments of the body. The three main segments that we just saw, the abdomen, pelvis, the middle abdomen, the middle chest area, the throat and head, and then one above the head. So it's a, it's a, it's a alchemical emblem describing a yogic process. But see, this is how the alchemists, alchemical practitioners would would pass their yoga, they couldn't actually describe it as, a, as an act of actual practice because then the church would be down there breathing down their neck and busting them and putting them in jail or burning them at the stake. So they just made a symbolic, this is a symbolic picture, you know, you figure it out. And what, what gave me the key, what finally confirmed for me the key, is the outhouse. See the outhouse next to the lowest sphere? It's the pelvic. That's like a little key that's built in. And this is another one, you've probably seen this, the serpent devours its own tail. And um, that um, the serpent is, a, is an energy, the serpentine. Kundalini is called a serpent. It's kind of the energy that goes around this, uh, goes up, you know, the Kundalini is supposed to go up. Up, this, up the spine from the root chakra to the crown chakra. But in the Taoist tradition, they have a completely different tradition. They have, yes, there's an energy that goes up, and then there's a, it goes up the back and comes over the top and goes down the front. That's what they call it, up the back, over the top, comes down the front. There's a meridian that comes down here from the nose and goes down to the pelvic, and then there's another meridian that goes up the back, over the top of the head, and they both meet there, as you can see here. In the upper image here, the Ouroboros image. Um, so um, the governor vessel Yang is uh, goes up the energy goes up the back, and the, the Yin conception vessel <coughs> goes down goes up the front, and they meet at this point, the point of consciousness, above the upper lip, point twenty-eight. This is where it. Uh, I had a revelation because I had a, a friend of mine who's a, and we were talking about this work and she's an acupuncturist and she pointed out that this point where the two channels meet, the yang governor vessel up the, from up the back called associated with heaven and the yin governor vessel, conception vessel going up the front meet at that point. And that's the point called the point of consciousness. You stimulate that point in acupuncture when somebody's unconscious or drunk or in a coma. Interesting, isn't it? That's exactly the point. So I think the image, and that's the image of the serpent with its own tail in its mouth. Yeah, in fact, you could try that yourself. Point, uh, touch this point right now. You know, it, it's a kind of additional, let me see, right? Let me see, or let me think makes a connection between heaven and earth, the yang and the yin. Let me remember, see. 
in the in the book the alchemical divination I have some examples of how this is used and it's used to to revive people if, if somebody's gone unconscious or drunk uh, and uh, uh, like first aid might be useful to remember sometime um, okay okay I'm just about finished I think I should finish pretty soon and uh, so these are four statements that are so, sort of summarize um, the basic principles of the work that I call alchemical divination. Um, and it has to do with memory, as I mentioned, you know, memory going into the past, uh, but integrating it, bringing it back to the present. So intentional memory with conscious integration is remembering and leads to healing an increased wholeness. Unconscious memory, like without integration, is flashback, regression. You know, somebody's suddenly back in their childhood trauma and acting from that. and leads to hopelessness or useless nostalgia. You just say, oh, you think about the good old days when I was happy and didn't have to worry about a thing. My parents took care of me, whatever. <laughs> Intentional vision with conscious integration is inspiration. Inspiration means spirit coming in and leads to realization and creative expression. In creative expression, you make the vision real. Unconscious vision without integration is fantasy and leads to loss of faith and pointless distractions. Now, unless, I mean, you, not to say that fantasy is bad, you know, if you have a fantasy and then you, you write a book about it, like, uh, what's that book series called? The, the uh, Harry, Potter. Uh, Harry Potter, you know, and become a millionaire and write dozens of books and it inspires people and gives good stories. Absolutely, that's a, that's a way of realizing that vision or compose music or paint it or something that's completely different but if you just think oh, uh, think about it someday I'll do that and it leads to uh, loss of faith and pointless distraction people don't know what am I doing with my life <laughs> I'll go to this thing and go to that thing like that so that's the idea so with that uh, I thank you for your attention and uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Could we take a break? And yes, then please. Questions. questions. Yeah, I love questions. I may not be able to have an answer, but I no, I will have an answer. Is that a question? Getting into my studies 30 or 40 years ago? 50, 50 years ago, actually. 50? Yeah. My first psychedelic experience occurred in 1961. <laughs> yes, of course. If I'd gone on a different path, it would have been different. But, you know, then uh, I've, I've just finished writing this series of seven books. But they're all short books. They're like no more than 120 pages uh, called The Ecology of Consciousness. That's sort of summarizing and distillation of everything that I've learned about states of consciousness and its changes and everything and uses and applications over the past 30, 40 years. And um, um, so um, um, that's what I would, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing. So that's, uh, it's impossible to give a short answer to that question. Uh, but we also, Ram Das and I also wrote a book that's a more personal book. It's a kind of a more autobiographical statement called Birth of a Psychedelic Culture. And what that, uh, that was published, written and published about three or four years ago. It's a form of a dialogue conversation. 
uh, and also includes about a five-year period from early 60, 61 to about 66, uh, when we started the Harvard Psychedelic Project. And then uh, for a while, we had a, this community uh, of people continuing our studies, but not on the, no longer under academic auspices at Harvard, but this intentional community in the mid-60s, early 60s, at Millbrook, New, in Millbrook, New York. Oh, they really want us to leave. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that, that sort of is more the, uh, the, the human story, you know, of, of, of that period and historical. Uh, although, you know, there have been a number of different books written about that, the Harvard Psychedelic Club, and, uh, which has sort of the attitude of, oh, well, that's, people did these crazy things and took drugs, and aren't we sophisticated now that we're no longer doing that? And that's sort of the mass culture image of the 60s. You know, it was like a wild and crazy time where people did these wild and crazy things and took these drugs, and look how bad that was, and da-da-da, and aren't we now so much more mature? That's all false. That whole story is false, completely false. What actually happened was it's a split in the culture. There's a mainstream culture of medical psychiatric research which was basically stopped cold for 20 years and is only now starting up again in a very, very small scale. But in the meantime, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people went underground and uh, I no longer use the term counterculture because this underground, uh, I use underground culture. It's not counter anything. It's not opposed to mainstream culture. It's just underground because it prefers to stay hidden for the, exactly the same reason as the alchemists stayed hidden. Because they did, people have this weird thing, they actually prefer not to go to jail or have their heads <laughs> cut off, you know? It's strange. They'd rather go on the, the underground psychedelic culture is thriving and is doing very well, thank you. Uh, and some of the underground, you know, emerges into above ground books and publications and writings and scientific research and uh, And uh, like my books and other people's books, many books. And many people doing, you know, their own uh, um, individual or group, small group, research for spiritual healing and um, creative inspiration. And of course, there's also misuse and there's recreational use, of course. That's a different thing. It's a different aspect of culture. That's always going on. And uh, I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's always going on. Of course, there's alcohol and there's alcoholism and there's drunk uh, people using opiate drugs for uh, pain control and there's people you know, smoking dope for whatever and there's marijuana wars and you know, it's, it's a big out aspect of, of our culture. So um, it's an amazing, but one thing is that's very clear is, and, uh, is that these consciousness expanding substances or consciousness modifying substances and I don't, I don't include the stimulants and the depressants. I mean, they, they uh, tranquilize as sedatives or stimulants like cocaine and so forth. They change consciousness, yes, but not in the same way. The psychedelic consciousness expanding drugs like LSD, psilocybin, mushrooms, uh, mescaline, peyote, and some of the newer ones like ayahuasca and so forth, um, is a completely different category of drugs. In fact, it's a category of drugs that can't be defined as a category. That's the thing people can't even agree what the name is for them. <laughs> Because, and you can't answer the question. Like when my, uh, uh, when a, per a person you know, who has no understanding of that culture asks, well, what does this drug do? I can't answer the question. Well, I have to say, well, it depends on the set, the setting, and uh, you, your history, <laughs> and uh, the uh, personality and intentions of the person who's giving it to you, if anybody. What you're trying to do with it, if anything, and if you just want to, you know, and that, that kind of confusion extends even to the internet. You go on the internet to sites like Arrowhead, and you'll see, you know, I tried this drug, I've tried all these other ones, and you know, there's da da da, uh, BBC, FIZ, all these numbers and so forth, just to see what it does. And I feel like saying, well, actually, the drug doesn't do anything, really. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. 
The question is, what are you doing with the drug? <laughs> Why are you taking it? And that'll help you understand, you know, even people who are relatively sophisticated and have a lot of history, they still don't often get that point with these drugs. Now, with the stimulants and depressants, it wouldn't matter. If you take a stimulant amphetamine or something, no matter what your set or intention is, you'll feel a little bit stimulated. <laughs> Same with the tranquilizers. But not with these drugs. That's why it's so hard to explain. And that's exactly the reason why it's always been esoteric. And will probably always remain esoteric. Because it'll always be misunderstood. Oh, you guys are just taking drugs. Right? I can't tell you the number of times I heard that accusation. Oh, you guys are just you know, running around in the woods dropping acid. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Why should I take you seriously? Now, that doesn't mean there weren't people running around in the woods taking acid. Of course there were. And the alchemists, the same thing. Oh, you're just the huffers and puffers, right? Trying to make gold. <laughs> Trying to make money, right? Selling drugs. They'll put you in jail for selling drugs. <laughs> Now, so people are sitting in jail for 30 years just for selling LSD, mescaline, cannabis, drugs that never hurt a single person. Crimes without victims. How about that? Crimes without victims. We have crimes without victims. And I think, see, I, I agree with the libertarians in that regard, not in some of the other policies which are sort of nutty. But they say, your personal drug use and your personal sexual relations are your business and not the state's and nobody else's. And crimes without victims ought to be taken off the books. Of course it's illegal and should be punished to give a drug to a minor, to give any drug to a minor or have sex with a minor or without, uh, to give something to anybody without their consent, explicit consent, and put them into safety. And we already have lots of laws on that thing. But for consenting adults, not the state's business. I think it'll, it'll always, but you know, that's a political question. It's a political issue. It's very much alive, but as we know, look at the marijuana wars going on now. And yeah, you know, I salute the state of Washington. They're pioneering. Uh, did you study under Ludwig Wittgenstein at Oxford? Did you ever study with him? I studied people, Wittgensteinians, yeah. I never met the man myself. Did he ever, to your knowledge, uh, do a linguistic analysis of consciousness? Did he ever study uh, the word and go into it? Like, he, he, did he ever study what? The word uh, consciousness. He was a linguistic. He was a linguist. I don't know. You'd have to read his books. I don't, I'm not a Wittgensteinian philosopher, uh, so uh, there. You know, I, I studied linguistic philosophy, but yeah. it's not my field. I just wondering if you would uh, give us a little synopsis of the if-if days. A little synopsis of the if-if days? Well, uh, when are we supposed to be out of here? <laughs> well, actually, The Birth of a Psychedelic Culture is the book to read. If-if yeah. was this organization, International Federation for Internal Freedom, that you know, Leary, Albert, myself, and a group of other people, half a dozen people, including Houston Smith, a religious philosopher, started to sponsor research with psychedelics after Harvard stopped the research. You know, the research was sponsored by Harvard at first with psilocybin, and then uh, uh, then Harvard no longer wanted to sponsor it, it uh, and psilocybin was no longer legally available, and so, but our group continued the research and uh, more with. Uh, other things that were illegal, that were available, but not, you know, the laws had not yet been passed. It was all perfectly legal. The psychedelic substance didn't become illegal until the late 60s. So um, this organization was formed to sort of, in general, act as a kind of a network for helping people gather, distributing information for people who wanted to, you know, take responsibility for their own explorations, which is sort of what happened. It didn't last very long. It didn't need to last very long. You know, it served its purpose, and um, it was. And, and as we, you know, as our project left, people left Harvard, and then uh, some people were fired. I was not fired. Le Leary was not fired. I wasn't. I didn't have a job. I was a graduate student or a postgraduate student. I couldn't be fired. So, um, and neither Leary nor Alfred ever regretted anything about doing. Them. Nobody was harmed. Nobody complained. Nobody complained. 
you know, the, the, the student, the undergraduate, we had an agreement to not, not to give the drugs to undergraduates, but Alpert gave the drug to an undergraduate. He didn't complain, his, you know, he said it was the greatest experience of my life. But his family and the university wanted to get rid of us, clearly. They did not want to have, uh, I did the same as Albert. I gave psilocybin to my girlfriend. She didn't complain. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Nor did her family. <laughs> but read The Birth of a Psychedelic Culture. It's a good book. In general, all my books, if you didn't get one here, they're all on my website, which was on the thing there, greenearthfound.org, and uh, including some of the other books that I've written that, you know, that I didn't bring with me. So, uh, But Birth of a Psychedelic Culture is an inter interesting book. And it's open-ended. In other words, we don't say, oh, yeah, like the the Harvard Psychedelic Club, which said, oh, well, that was a regrettable period when people did these crazy things. And I say, no, this story is not over. This is just a particular episode of five years. Humanity is a work in progress. Yeah, humanity is a work in progress. And so is the so-called whatever psychedelic movement, if it is a psychedelic movement, which has many aspects. It's like a mushroom, you know? It's like a fungus that has lots of tongue. You know, some of these fungi, you know, you know fungi are the largest organism on Earth? They've got fungi that extend 50, 50 square miles under the ground, one single organism. This is vast, fibrous network under the ground, invisible, in the soil. One organism. We don't know anything. We know so little, you know. We know so little. And we're always thinking of, oh, we know so much. <laughs> The wrong things, you know, the wrong things. Any, yes? I was just curious, I don't know if you mentioned this in the lecture, I might have missed it, but do you think, I was wondering if, if you're feeling right now that there is a resurgence in psychedelic usage. Because um, I, I mean, personally, I'm just hearing of a lot of people um, really starting to experiment uh, with ayahuasca. Heard some uh, some branch of the government or some people are um, I think using MDMA or, or ecstasy with PTSD right. with right. soldiers and I'm, right. I'm just really yes. getting surprised. I don't know if. Yes, no, there is, there's an organization called MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is a, a an organization that sponsors and raises money for a number of research projects, and they're, they're doing a lot of really interesting, there are maybe a couple of dozen Richard, uh, uh, very useful uh, research projects going on, uh, you know, by government approved, and not government funded, by the way, yeah, to get the government approval to do them is one thing. To get the money that has to be raised privately, you know, no government agency is going to fund it. But MAPS does that, and there's a number of different projects. The two main areas that I think show the greatest promises. One is in the use of MDMA in the treatment of trauma, post-traumatic stress syndrome, war, like war trauma, for example. This is an enormous problem. There are something like 500,000 military people from the different American wars who are suffering from PTSD, untreated, uncured, who commit suicide. Do you know that military people and ex-military people commit suicide at about 20 a month, every month, right now, now, even as we speak? And MDMA uh, is um, the only treatment now. It's not a treatment that's available. Research is being done for that treatment to become available to the average GI who, you know, has got trauma. It's going to take um, 50 million dollars and five more years of research projects. 50 million that's for, that, for that to become substance to become available as a, you know, uh, where a psychiatrist, certain clinics could. Uh, it won't be like a tranquilizer to take a trauma. That's what they give them now. But it has to be an experience. It, you know, just sit with, the doctor actually has to sit with the person for about five or six hours. You don't just take, the, take one and call me in the morning if you need a refill. You know, it's not like that. Then they understand that. They understand that. Now, then, then uh, but so then the, that area of trauma, MDMA, and MDMA much better than psilocybin or LSD. Then the other, the other big area, very big, maybe even bigger, uh, is uh, the use of LSD and psilocybin. Um, in the um, treatment of death anxiety, end of life. 
anxiety. And the, the kind of bureaucratic breakthrough there is that certain researchers have gotten permission to give these drugs uh, with the explicit understanding these people have got a terminal diagnosis, they're not going to get cured of their liver cancer or whatever it is. But just to alleviate the anxiety about dying. And as, uh, on my website, actually, you'll see a link to two short video clips of dying people who had a terminal diagnosis given psilocybin under a project at UCLA with Charles Grobe, which are very, very moving. And these people talking about it, what that experience did for them. And when you think about dying, alleviating anxiety and dying, I mean, PTSD is a big problem. Uh, end of life anxiety is what? Universal universal, and there's nothing to treat it. I mean, you have hospice, you know, which alleviates thing. But the anxiety, and for people to, uh, because there's no understanding what death actually is. The culture doesn't really understand death and hasn't for 2,000 years, since the mystery time. And since, um, you know, the, the Judeo-Christian tradition, the, uh, the idea of the afterlife, and life after death and reincarnation was exed out of Christian dogma in the fifth century. That means most people, the vast majority of people in the, in the population think, well, after die, I mean, you die, nothing happens. And that's not true. And never has been true. And most cultures in the world understood that. I understand that to this day. Buddhism, Hinduism, reincarnation statement. When you think about it, what that does to a person, if you think you're so identified with your body and your whole society tells you, well, this body, that's it, and it's going to be a piece of garbage. You know, you're going to bury it in the ground and you'll be just a fading memory in your family's life. Oh, not truly. What that means is that you're completely shut off from the, from the larger perspective that your life is just one life. <laughs> this is just one life in an infinite chain of lives. You have all eternity to learn the lessons of life and death. <laughs> and uh, so why would you ever want to waste one single one? So that, see, see, that significance of that is enormous. And just from the point of view of the individual, those, those two video clips, I recommend them to you. They're very, 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 very moving. These people, uh, you know, just, there's one woman she's talking about, she had, she had some cancer, liver cancer or something, and she said, I have all these fears, never taken a psychedelic drug before, all these fears, what's going to happen to my husband, it loves me, my children, my garden, my home, my, my body, I'm going to have pain, and, blah, blah, blah. and then she took the psilocybin, and she said she felt this sort of, all her fears, like a, like a fist clutching in her heart, in her chest. Just tight, 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 and then poof, it just dissolved. And when she, the thought she had, well, she had the thought first, and when it dissolved, she said, all these things I'm afraid of haven't happened. And I'm alive now, and my husband is alive now, and he loves me, and I love him. And I have this beautiful house and this beautiful garden. I love my flowers, my children. She's, she realized she was stuck in the future. Of course she was going to die, she was going to say, yes, but I'm alive now. She lived the rest of her few months, you know, happy. She was happy. She started, take, took up gardening, took up a new thing, spent time with her family. End of life. What a gift that is, you know. What a gift that could be for people. So, anyway, it's on my website you see this, that one and another one. Uh, psilocybin, end of life. So th those are the two areas. Then psilocybin also used the treatment of obsessive compulsive you know, disorders, which have kind of fixated states of consciousness. So there's about a dozen, a couple of dozen research projects in different parts of the country, or world actually, Europe, Spain, France, uh, England, uh, different study. And then of course marijuana is another whole vast area. Marijuana is a psychedelic, but you know, it's also, uh, it has some psychedelic features, but it's it's also, you know, a very versatile herb and heals all kinds of really serious chronic illnesses. It actually heals certain forms of cancer. Not just alleviates the pain of cancer, it actually heals them. So, uh, so there's a lot to do and a lot of things to get involved in. But all of that is above ground and underground, of course, is another whole story. In my, in my books, I'm talking more about the underground, but I'm also talking about some about the above ground. One more, maybe? Yeah, just time for one more question. Okay. Following along on that, the question I had was, um, now that Washington's legal, what kind of implications do you think that might have for the uh, consciousness reasoning that you... 
Well, I, I can only assume that the, the good people of Washington who choose to uh, partake of cannabis can now do so with a clear conscience and without fear of being busted. And, and uh, I think they're setting a, a good example. And the authorities are setting a good example by not just you know, taking it off the books, but setting up a system for distribution, quality control, da 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 da. You can't just, you know, like, um, just rush out there and do it. So it's a social uh, experiment, and it's, you know, there's 48 states, so who knows how long it'll take Alabama to legalize it. <laughs> but then, and not everybody has to live, wants to live in Alabama, you know? And the same is happening in other countries. You know? If you go to Indonesia, you can get thrown in jail. You can get the death penalty for having drugs. It's a big world. <laughs> so, and just like people, a big variety. Um, so uh, I did want to mention that in the workshop tomorrow, um, maybe some of you are coming. We're going to be doing some guided meditation processes. No drugs will be taken, of course, except the ones that you take yourself, like caffeine in the morning. That is a drug, by the way. <laughs> um, and um, um, but we'll be doing processes of exploring consciousness. We we'll do some some memory processes and some visioning processes using uh, the the vehicle uh, because you the, the drug plays the role of a of an accelerator, or amplifier of awareness, what we'll be using shamanic methods of rattling with a drum, where the, the rhythmic rattle of a, no, of a ra rattle rather than a drum, uh, and uh, so that's a shamanic method, provides an aid to concentration in doing a shamanic journey, and meditation, guided meditation processes, uh, which can also change consciousness, and divinations in the sense of asking questions, maybe looking at certain periods in your life, and what the implications are like that. So I look forward to seeing some of you. Shall we leave it at that? Again, yeah. I thank you Hi. for your... Yeah, my name is Jennifer, and you asked what time it was. Um, oh. Should I ask my question? Is there what? Well, I was thinking about a rose of Paracelsus, that story by Borges, when you were talking about the universe expanding and and I guess I started thinking about that, that phrase, the thought is the thought of the thoughtless. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, underst I'm not understanding what you're saying at all, yeah. for some reason. I is your microphone? It's a brief question, so perhaps. You're asking me about your Borges, a book by Borges? No, yeah, I, I don't. I, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask if um, you think the Voynich manuscript, if you've ever heard of it, might be a reference. The what? The Voynich Manuscript. Uh, I don't understand what that is. What, okay. what are you saying? What words yeah. are you, I don't understand your words. Is there something? The, what are you saying? Quite a lot of things. Um, Let me just hold the microphone a little way. Try that. Okay. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Um, quite a lot of things that you said that were very profound and that I've been thinking about.